Um, okay, so today we have Elisa Ferreira uh, talking to us about um, fuzzy ultralight dark matter um, and, uh, and fuzzy dark matter. Um, so Elisa got her PhD from McGill in, in 2017 and then, um, or since then has been a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Astrophysics and Gushing and is a, a professor at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil and later this year is starting uh, a position at Cavalry uh, IPMU in, in Tokyo. So we're very grateful to have Elisa here uh, to give this talk today. And, um, and I know that people are excited to hear it. So thank you for, for speaking and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Let me share my slides. Um... So can you see the presentation? Yeah, Great. looks good. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very glad that I, I was invited to give this talk uh, for you guys. Um, I'm going to talk today about ultralight dark matter, uh, this general class of dark matter models. I was asked to give an overview of this class of models. Uh, I know that in the audience we have specialists on the topic, so I hope it's not boring for you. Some of them are responsible for some of the bounds that I'm going to talk about today. So the idea is that I'm going to give a general review about this class of models, uh, my view of how we can classify them. And also I want to give uh, an update of how uh, these models, the bounds on these models are uh, to this date. Um, and I also have a lot of extra slides. So if you have any questions, please let me know. We can go further in some topics uh, if you're interested. So um, I guess for this audience, I don't need to motivate the evidence of the necessity of having dark matter in our universe, which is the scaffolding of all the structures that we have in our universe. And the evidence for the existence of dark matter is huge and coming from many systems, many scales. Uh, and each of these evidence not only tells us about the necessity of having dark matter, but also tells us a little bit about the properties that this dark matter, this component that we still don't know what it is, um, has. So that's why we have to measure dark matter in many different scales by using many different observables. With all these observations, and especially the large scale the large scale observations, which are the most precise that we have, cosmologists were able to build the standard cosmological model, the Lambda CDM model, which is a very successful description of our universe, of how our universe evolves and what is its composition. And in this model, uh, dark matter, which is responsible for 26, 27% of the matter of our universe, it is uh, modeled as this hydrodynamical fluid uh, that we called cold dark matter. So the knowledge that we have of dark matter today or the, um, our best guess um, that it is very well measured on large scale structure is that dark matter is a cold dark matter fluid uh, which has the following characteristics. So it's cold, it means that it moves slower than C is pressureless, it has a very small pressure or even zero pressure if you are um, in some models, which means that you can cluster in, uh, on all scales. It is dark or transparent as some people say, so it has no or very weakly electromagnetic interaction and it is collisionless, there's no self-interaction. And also we know the abundance of dark matter today. And this description of dark matter, this hydrodynamical description of dark matter has been working quite well, as we can see here in the power spectrum, which is the two point correlation function of, of galaxies that we see in our universe that we translate into this power spectrum in Fourier space that uh, using uh, the Lambda CDM model can really describe quite well many scales of our universe uh, using different observables. So the Lambda CDM is very precise. It should work uh, very precisely on large scales and describes uh, dark matter quite well on, on those scales. However, 
uh, there's a lot of structure in our universe. And this structure, especially on the small scales, um, follows some, um, it's not well constrained yet, not as well constrained as the large scale structures in our universe are. So we change a little bit of what we know about dark matter. So dark matter needs to behave in this way on large scales, but on small scales, on smaller scales, we can see we, we have uh, freedom because we still haven't measured quite well the properties of dark matter on those scales. We have some freedom to relax a little bit those, um, those, uh, those properties, like how cold it is, does it interact with itself or not? Does it, is it allowed to have a small charge? And this we can see here in the far spectrum, which is a cartoon vision of it, that we still haven't measured quite well how those small scale structures uh, behave. And this allows us uh, to, to have um, richer, uh, maybe phenology, phenology for dark matter on small scales. So dark matter, whatever theory it is, it needs to behave like CDM on large scales, but on small scales, we still have some freedom to have a different properties. Another set of uh, ideas that maybe instigate us to think a little bit that dark matter might have different properties than what CDM uh, tells us are this, uh, what, which are called small scale problems or some people call small scale curiosities that are um, discrepancies between what we observe in our universe and what we see from simulations where we have simulations uh, using CDM uh, as the dark matter component. One of them, for example, is the cusp core problem, where we can see that from simulations of CDM alone, only dark matter, we see that the density versus radius of those, uh, of the profile of the halo of those galaxies should uh, go to infinity, it should diverge for small radius. But when you measure those things observationally, you see that they don't diverge. You actually see that they have a core here that we should, or a constant part here. So this is the cusp core problem. There are other problems like the missing satellites, the too big to fail problem. But another problem that another problem that I like, I think is very interesting, is the regularity versus diversity of rotation curves which tells us that although galaxies are very diverse, we have galaxies of different masses, different colors, different shapes, uh, they're incredibly regular. And this regularity is embodied in some scalar, scaling relations. Like for example, the most famous, the bionic Tully-Fisher relation, which is this remarkably tight correlation between the bionic mass of the galaxy versus the circular velocity of the galaxy. And not only from simulations uh, uh, that predict this curve here, uh, the observations don't match the simulation, but a more important point, it is how tight this correlation is. So the, in some places it's tighter than the error bars of the points. Uh, and this cannot be explained by CDM or at least by these simple um, simulations. To explain those small scale of curiosities, uh, we can have a few different explanations. It is not clear yet if those small scale problems or these curiosities or these behaviors that dark matter have on small scales can come from feedback because from in the past we had not included those in simulations, but now we have started to include them and they seem to be the solution for some of those problems. Some people have said, Maybe we have to modify the dynamics in galaxies. Um, Milgram uh, coined this empirical relation for um, how the acceleration in galaxies work. Uh, this empirical relation says that it follows the Newtonian acceleration for large accelerations, but it follows a different relation, the geometric mean of the Newtonian and A naught, which is something you measure from data if you are in uh, small acceleration uh, places. And this relation works quite well to explain rotation curves and all those scaling relations that I said. If you transform this empirical relation into a modified gravity theory, for example, which is what uh, MOND theory actually is, 
Um, this has some challenges to explain, for example, large scale, um, large scale uh, observations. Um, and it is still a very challenging explanation to, to make it work so we can make it work. And another thing you can do is modify dark matter. I just say that dark matter behaves like CDM on large scales and on small scales dark matter can be, can uh, behave in a different way. So given this knowledge or this lack of knowledge of dark matter, how it behaves on small scales and given all the possible mechanisms that we can um, have to explain these behaviors, these properties that we measure from dark matter, um, we have uh, scientists uh, and have been um, producing many different models of dark matter. So the, although the microphysics of dark matter is still un unknown, we have many different possible explanations um, using very different phenomena to explain dark matter. For example, as we can see here in this very simple uh, mass scale um, uh, plot of the possible dark matter candidates, of course, dark matter has other dimensions, but here, for example, showing the mass, we can invoke things, microscopic things with solar masses of like primordial black holes to explain dark matter. We can have other um, particles to explain dark matter, or we can even invoke very, very light new candidates to explain dark matter, spamming something like 80 or even more orders of magnitude. So not only we have very different phenomena, very different things from composite things, from macroscopic things, from uh, microscopic things to explain dark matter, we also have a very huge spam of masses and even interactions and other parameters that they can explain dark matter that is still are allowed by everything I said before, all the properties I said before that should have on large scales and on small scales. So this really tells us that maybe the small scales can offer some hints on the nature of dark matter. So we can actually probe the microphysics or the nature of dark matter, the properties even particle physics properties of dark matter using those small scales. And maybe this can help us understand a little bit more about dark matter. So today I'm going to talk about one of those models. I'm going to talk about the lightest possible model for dark matter, which I call ultralight dark matter. It has many different names as we are going to see during the presentation. Uh, but this is the lightest possible dark matter candidate. And why is this candidate interesting? And what is the idea of this candidate? So um, ultralight uh, dark matter, uh, it is the lightest possible candidate for dark matter. And what does this mean? This means that I'm going to choose a super light candidate. And when I say, say light, it's something like 10 to the minus 57 kilograms to 10 to the minus 35 kilograms. So it's very light. It has to be a boson to be this light and be dark matter and have high occupation numbers. And it has to be non-thermally produced. And if I have such a light candidate, uh, this candidate has a large de Broglie wavelength. So if we remember our um, physics undergrad uh, where we talked about wave particle duality, we remember, for example, that electrons, when you do a double slit experiment, Although we can also measure that they behave like particles, we see that in the double slit, they have the pattern of a wave. So we know that, for example, all particles in our universe, they can behave as a particle or as a wave. And the wave number that they have is given by this. So it's one over the mass times the velocity of this particle. So for example, an electron, an accelerated electron, which is super light, will have a de Broglie wavelength of 10 to the minus 10 meters. We would have a de Broglie wavelength that is really small. You see here for a golf ball, for example. But if I have a dark matter component that is very, very light, like the ones we propose here, we're going to have that they have a de Broglie wavelength of orders of kiloparsec for the lower bound to parsec to the lower bound. And this is actually of the order of the size of a galaxy or a, a halo of a galaxy. So the idea of these models is that on small scales, because the de Broglie wavelength of these ultralight particles is large, they're going to behave as waves. 
in galaxies. So the, the behavior in galaxies is not like uh, if dark matter was particles anymore, but it will be uh, the behavior of a wave. But outside on large scales, when I'm looking really far away to this dark matter particles, uh, these waves are super small. So they are going to behave effectively like particles. So on large scales, it behaves exactly like particle dark matter or like CDM. Uh, and on small scales and galaxies, it's going to have this wave-like behavior. Um, and this model has many uh, strengths, as I'm going to explain later. It has a very good motivation from particle physics and also condensed matter. Uh, it, it might uh, be able to address some of those small scale problems, but it also, and this is the most important uh, motivation for this model, it has a very rich phenomenology on small scales, giving this wave-like behavior um, in galaxies. And this wave-like behavior in galaxies that these ultralight particles have are going to give us a very rich phenomenology on small scales. Not only very rich, but also very uh, distinct from other dark matter models, as I'm going to explain um, later. But uh, there's many models uh, that are this type of model that has an ultralight particle as the responsible for dark matter um, in the literature. And they receive many different names, as many of you might have seen. Fuzzy dark matter, scalar dark matter, wave dark matter, BC dark matter. But they can actually be um, divided in three classes. And here I just emphasize that this is um, a division, like a classification based on their behavior on small scales. So it is a practical uh, classification on how they behave. So if each of those models behave in the same way, they're classified through this um, same class. Um, so no, not necessarily you have, you have models in each class that can, can come from microphysical uh, models or even just a phenomenological model, but they behave in the same way. Um, on small scales. So we can classify in three classes, for example. So the first one and the simplest one is the fuzzy dark matter, which is basically just a ultralight particle um, under gravity. So if you have just this under uh, ultralight particle under the influence of gravity that has only one degree of freedom, which is the mass of this ultralight particle. If this we put self-interaction. So if we put that those particles interact with each other, we have the self-interacting fuzzy dark matter model that has two degrees of freedom. And we have a third model that also um, is a ultralight dark matter model, which is the dark matter superfluid. Unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about this model today, but it's a very interesting model. Uh, it is a model of ultralight particles that um, behave um, that has the same idea. They have this wave behavior in galaxies. Uh, but inside galaxies, they actually have a different dynamic. So it behaves like MOND, like that empirical relation of MOND that I said on small scales inside galaxies. So it's a very interesting model. Unfortunately, I won't talk about it today, but I'll be very happy to answer questions about it. So today I'll focus on uh, the fuzzy dark matter and a little bit in the self-interacting dark fuzzy dark matter model, which are the models that have been more studied and they have the best bounds nowadays. Uh, so why are those models interesting? Uh, not only because, for example, the fuzzy dark matter is a very simple model that has this very rich phenomenology, but also because it can, can have a connection with particle physics. So not only these models can be just you get a phenomenological model with um, a ultralight particle, but axions and axion light particles can also be part of this model. So we know axions from, the, for example, the QCD axion, which is this uh, particle that was invoked uh, to solve the CP problem in QCD. So the QCD axiom uh, has the mass around 10 to the minus, I don't know, six here, or around 10 to the minus 10 to the 10 to the minus five. So this is the QCD axiom. However, if you have an axiom particle, which is something that comes from the breaking of uh, a U1 symmetry, for example, and we can have many of those axioms 
coming from string theory, for example, um, or if you have axon-like particles, uh, you can have maybe uh, axions and axon-like particles that are lighter than the QCD axon. And those axons that are lighter than the QCD axon are going to have a larger de Broglie wavelength, and they're going to have a bigger influence in galaxies. So for those models, we usually focus in the uh, in the lower part of the of the of the mass uh, spectrum, because uh, although all of those axons in this range can behave like dark matter, some of them not all the dark matter, uh, or you have tighter bounds if they are all the dark matter. Only the ones that are in this lower part, they are going to have a bigger influence um, in the dynamics of galaxies. So today I'm going to focus more in this range of particles that are between 10 to the minus 24, 10 to the minus 18, something like that, because those are the ones that are going to have this wave-like behavior in galaxies that is going to be very pronounced and it's going to create this rich um, uh, phenomenology on galaxies. And those axons are ultralight axons. They are available from different uh, explanations. So having this um, motivation for those models, how do we describe these models? So first, let's talk a little bit about the cosmological evolution of these models, which is very simple. Um, here, I'm not going to enter into much detail. So basically what we have, for example, in the fuzzy dark matter, we have uh, this ultralight particle in a cosmological background, which here is the Friedman, Hobbes, and Walker background. Uh, here, H is the Hubble uh, parameter. And this scalar field, uh, which represents this ultralight field, uh, the particle, evolves following this um, equation of motion, where here is the mass, and here this term is only present if I have the self-interaction. And when I have this type of potential, which I show uh, a cartoon here, you're going to have a field that it is slowly rolling here uh, to the potential until it gets to a point that is going to uh, oscillate on the bottom of the potential, and then it's going to behave like dark matter at this time. The axons and lights and light particles have this type of potential. That's why we say that they are in this class of model as well. It's very easy to see what I just said in this very nice uh, image from David Marsh, the review from 2016, where we can see that now I remove the the interaction here, just so it's easier uh, to see. So in the early universe, when this term is winning from the mass term, we have something that behaves like dark energy, something that is frozen. So we can see here the field frozen. And when this mass is of order of the Hubble parameter, it starts oscillating on the bottom of the potential. And we can see here in the solution of the field, it oscillates on the bottom of the potential. And this equation of state uh, on average is the equation of state of dark matter. And to behave like dark matter, we have to have that those oscillations happen before matter radiation equality. So uh, if the mass of the particle is bigger than 10 to the minus 28 EV, this will happen. So it will behave like dark matter today. It will start oscillating before equality. And today we are going to describe this as dark matter. Uh, in our universe. So this is the requirement that we have from cosmology. But we're interested here in this talk, mostly in how those, the evolution of those models on small scales. We want to know what happens on galaxies or in those small scales where we have, we see a difference from lambda CDM. So for that, we have to take the non-activistic regime of that theory of that equation that I just showed uh, of, of the real, relativistic uh, theory that I just showed, because this is the regime re re relevant for structure formation. So if I take the uh, non-relativistic non regime of that klein gordon equation that I showed before, I see that the fuzzy dark matter and the self-interacting fuzzy dark matter are described by a Schrodinger equation shown here, which is coupled to the Poisson equation, which describes how the gravitational potential phi evolves or, or is described in terms of the density that we have. Uh, in the presence of self-interaction, this term is present. 
So we have the self-interacting dark matter model. And if this term is zero, we have the fuzzy dark matter model. And just by looking at this equation, we can already see how, how different this is from CDM, for example, or warm dark matter or other models of dark matter. We can also rewrite these equations by making this transformation here where I associate the field to a density and the velocity here to the phase. And we can write these equations in a fluid description like a, a hydrodynamical type equation. Uh, where we have here the continuity equation uh, that tells us that the um, energy density is conserved. And we have here an Euler-like equation. Um, it's not exactly an Euler equation because it has an extra term here, which is called quantum pressure, which is only present in this type of models. This name quantum pressure is kind of a misnomer that comes from history because this will be present even if this is not a quantum system. It, only has to be described by this type of equation. And this term is not present if you have, for example, if you're describing CDM. This term is only present if you have uh, this type of models. If I have interaction again, I'll have an extra term here to interaction. And this term is going to be a term that counteracts gravity. So this already tells us that this term really shows us how different is going to be the dynamic, uh, dynamics of this model. We can see this, for example, very easily um, in this cartoon image. So this term is counteracting gravity. So here in the case of fuzzy dark matter, I have gravity trying to clump things and quantum pressure avoiding this. If I have uh, self-interaction, this self-interaction can be either attractive, helping gravity or repulsive, um, helping quantum pressure. And because I have this competition between counter pressure and gravity, um, I'm going to have uh, a jinx length here, which is going to be where I have hydrodynamical equilibrium. But inside of this region where quantum pressure wins, I don't have structure formation. So in this region, gravity uh, is much smaller than quantum pressure. And I have a stable solution for my, for my hydrodynamical equation. And inside of this region, I don't have structure formation. Outside of this region, outside the gene's length, uh, I'm going to have uh, clumping is going to occur in a normal way, like for example, in CDM. Um, in the case of attractive or repulsive interaction, this is very different. In case of attractive interaction, I can only form very small uh, genes uh, regions, like stable regions. And in the case of the repulsive, I can have either small or big regions. So this tells us that we're going to have a very different dynamics than we have, for example, for CDM, where we have clustering on all scales. In this model, we don't have clustering on small scales, on scales smaller than the genes length. And the genes length, for example, for fuzzy dark matter, it is something uh, of this order. Uh, uh, if I have, for example, 10 to the minus 22 EV matter, so it's going to be something like 55 kiloparsec. So uh, this shows us that this is of the order of kiloparsec scales, something that is very relevant for galactic scales. So what is the consequence of this? What is the consequence of having this different description that this model brings us and for having this finite uh, genes length? We're going to see that this brings us very different uh, phenomenology um, in, in on small scales. We start by suppression of small structures. So a direct consequence of having this finite genes length or this finite uh, length here in the case of the interaction case is that you don't have structure on small scales. We can already see this here from the simulation from Simon May from this year, where we have uh, on the bottom uh, here, we have CDM and on the top we have fuzzy dark matter. Uh, and we can see uh, already expecting by eye that in this one, we don't have those small scale um, structures that we see here in the CDM simulation. We can be more precise. We can, for example, calculate the two point correlation function between two points uh, and take the Fourier transform of it. So we can calculate the power spectrum. And the power spectrum of fuzzy dark matter is going to show this suppression on small scales. Or on small scales. So in green uh, or in blue here, we see um, 
the CDM prediction. So you have clustering on all scales. Um, but for the fuzzy dark matter, for different masses, um, we can see that on small scales, we're going to have a suppression of the power or suppression of the formation of structures on those. On those. And depending on the mass, this can be even in the linear regime, which is already um, something that we can use observations to constrain. We can also see this um, in the halo or subhalo mass function. So this means that if I have this suppression on small scales, I'll also have less halos uh, that are um, less of the small halos. I will only have bigger halos in this scenario. As we can see here, for example, if I have CDM and if I have fuzzy dark matter, for example, I won't have the production of halos that are uh, smaller than 10 to the eight solar masses. So this universe will have, um, we won't have small halos. So this is one of the predictions of this model. Another prediction is the formation of a solitonic core. So if I go, uh, we talked before about more or less linear scales, but if I want to see what happened in non-linear scales, I need simulations to understand what is going on. And a consequence of having uh, this suppression of small scales is that we're going to have the formation of a core inside galaxies. So here we see, for example, a simulation done by one of my students. Here we have the formation of a halo, as we can see here. And inside of this halo, uh, because you don't have formation of structures on small scales, you can form a core or a region where the density is constant, the density doesn't grow. So one prediction of this model is that we're going to have a density profile for halos of galaxies that have a core in the interior here. Uh, so something like this, so the density becomes constant. Uh, while outside the halo, in the outskirts of the halo, it behaves like CDM uh, with the profile predicted by CDM, which is the NFW profile. So it follows the NFW profile for large radio, radius, but it has a core, it predicts a core for small radius. From simulations, uh, we can uh, fit, have a fitting function for how uh, this profile here uh, behaves. Uh, that is given here uh, from Chief's simulation from 2014. And we need this type of predictions of how the core depends on the mass of our particle and also on the mass of the halo. So we can able to extract from information, from, from observations, the mass, the constraints and bounds on the mass of those models, for example. Um, another very interesting phenomenology uh, that is a consequence of those models is uh, the phenomenology that comes from wave interference. So as we can see here in the simulations that I showed, it's very easy to see that we have some interference patterns that we can see here around and also in the simulation by Mox from 2017. And this comes, uh, those are constructive in, in, and destructive interference patterns that have because this behaves as a wave. We call this uh, granules, um, and they are of order of the de Broglie wavelength of those, of, of those. So it depends on the mass of these models. And we see those in simulations, and we would be very happy to observe those. But those are very hard to observe, given that they are so small, they are of the order of the de Broglie wavelength. But there is a very nice advancement and, uh, in this field, so to try to observe this. Uh, interference patterns that comes from that are predicted and expected from these models. Another consequence from the fact that we have this wave like um, dark matter is the formation of vortices, which are sites in the fluid where you have um, uh, non vanishing curls. So you have this uh, rotation uh, in one specific loca location of your fluid. Uh, and those are predicted uh, by Hui in 2020 to happen in the fuzzy dark matter model. They should happen in the outskirts of the halo where you have destructive uh, interference pattern. So whenever you have destructive interference pattern, you have a place where you have like zero density. Around this place, you're going to have the formation of a vortex. 
Or you also expect them in self-interacting fuzzy dark matter models uh, when you introduce rotation to this. So you expect them to form um, vortices. And these are also something that would be very interesting to observe because this would be kind of a smoking gun of those models and of this wave uh, property that those models have. Another uh, consequence of these models is that they have different dynamical effects. Uh, they can have uh, different, uh, different types of friction, of heating, um, or relaxation in, with respect to other models. For example, if we talk about relaxation, we are going to talk about the formation of a Bose-Einstein condensate. So some of you might have heard that um, some people think, uh, and there's a debate in the community, if those models form a Bose-Einstein condensate, in the center of the galaxy. So in this region where I don't have uh, the formation of, the formation of, uh, or that I don't have clustering, that I have a stable solution in the center of the halos where I have the core. Um, there is, a, some people believe that this can be in uh, BC, a Bose-Einstein condensate state. And what is a Bose-Einstein condensate? So a crash course, just so we remember. So a Bose-Einstein condensate is when you have a fluid uh, that when you lower the temperature of this fluid, you have that all the particles in this fluid or most of the particles in this fluid go to the ground state. So when you have this macroscopic occupation of the ground state, uh, you have the formation of both anxious condensate. And when this happens, you don't describe your model anymore by the individual particles of this model, but you describe it by the wave function of the collective of this uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. So it behaves like a single wave function or a collective wave function of your entire fluid. Uh, some uh, fluids, they also have uh, the property of superfluidity when they condense. So if you have a superfluid after you condense, uh, this will have a different dynamics, which is to flow without friction, as we show here in this video where after it reaches condensation, this superfluid is, has no friction anymore and it starts going around the cup. Um, so this new dynamics of flowing without friction happens after condensation. And just fluids that have self-interaction behaves like a superfluid. And the description that they have here I show in the mean field approximation uh, is that they are described by a nonlinear Schrodinger equation very similar to the one that we are, um, exactly the one that we are using for, for the ultralight dark matter. So this really tells us that there is the possibility that this is a Bose-Einstein condensate either from the beginning of the universe or maybe this will form a Bose-Einstein condensate after the halo is formed. Um, this was, for example, uh, shown uh, by Guth, um, Hertzberg, and Shanda in 2014. They advocate that uh, it's possible to have thermalization of, this, of these particles in the halo. And thermalization is one key, um, one key thing that you need to have condensation. You have to have uh, that this fluid is in thermal equilibrium. So they show using QFT, that you can have, for example, thermalization in the halo of a galaxy, which allows the formation of this ground state. Uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate is when all the particles of the majority of the particles go to the ground state. So they show that you can have the formation of this ground state uh, solutions in the center of the galaxies that we, show, we call soliton or Bose stars. In this specific article, they called both stars, the ones that you have in fuzzy dark matter and solitons, the ones that you have in the self-interacting fuzzy dark matter. But this is used um, interchangeably in the literature. And in a work by Lefkov, and then after by Kirkpatrick and collaborators, they also show the formation of this Bose-Einstein condensate in using simulations. In the case, they use wave turbulence uh, theory to do this uh, classical analog simulations of the formation of a Bose-Einstein condensate. And they showed that the time of formation of this condensate 
in those simulations is smaller than the age of the universe. So it's possible that you have this formation. And in the simulations, you have the formation of a condensate here only through gravity uh, without any seed, without introducing any seed for the formation of this. So it was um, shown that um, it's possible to have. However, uh, at least in my opinion, and I would love to hear the opinion of the other specialists, I think this is still an open question. Um, maybe we need an analytical description of this since those simulations are only analogs of the Schrodinger equation valid for small amount of times. Um, and maybe a discussion of maybe if the classicality of this use is broken at some point, um, but I don't want to enter too much into this, this topic. I just want to say that the formation of a bullseye and condensate um, in the center of these galaxies is still an open question and a very interesting one, in my opinion. Uh, there's also other heating effects that can happen uh, for the fact that you have this wave-like behavior. Uh, for example, you can have heating of stars because you have this wave-like behavior, um, or you can have dynamical friction, a different dynamical friction um, because of these models. I also won't have time to enter too much into this, but just so you know, we have a very rich um, different dynamical effects that those the, those models can have. Um, and uh, giving all these effects that I said, this, all these predictions that we have from this model in, on small scales, we can now use different observations, cosmological, astrophysical observations to try to constrain um, the, the parameters of this ultralight dark matter model. I'm going to focus today on the fuzzy dark matter model, because like I said, it's the simplest, the most studied, and the ones that we have the most stringent bounds. Um, and, um, and this is the status, I would say, I would just say now, but maybe uh, from six months ago or something like that, of the bounds in the mass of the fuzzy dark matter. So here's the mass of the fuzzy dark matter. The highlighted regions are the forbidden regions for the mass. And here we have many different um, ways um, that we could constrain this mass. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them. So for example, yeah. I can use, yes. Um, do you have a rough time of when, how much oh. left? So how, how did I pass already? I thought well, I had it's, five more yeah. minutes. Yeah, I mean, five more minutes is okay. Okay, great, sorry. Okay. I, I thought I had more time, sorry. Um, so the large scales gives us um, the following bound. So we have the suppression of structure on those scales. So we can probe, try to constrain the suppression of scales. And the, the, the best bound that we have nowadays actually on the fuzzy dark matter model comes from Lyman Alpha. Um, that tells us that um, this needs to be bigger than 10 to the minus 20 EV. Um, but we have other bounds uh, here, for example, those from uh, David Marsh and collaborators that tells us uh, also bounds on if the dark matter is not 100% of the dark matter, all these other bounds take into consideration the dark matter is 100% of the dark matter, especially the ones here. We can also use um, other gravitational probes like gravitational lensing and stellar strings to probe uh, substructures or the presence or the lack of um, their presence. And we can put bounds also in the mass, like the ones that we have here. We can use dynamical effects like dynamical friction or heating uh, to also put some bounds in the mass of the fuzzy dark matter, like we can see here. Or we can use, for example, the presence of the core to put some mass of uh, some bounds. Uh, like we did, for example, in this article from this year, which is the, um, the most, the, the tightest bound on the, 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 the mass of fuzzy dark matter to date, um, which is, uh, you, we use ultra faint dwarfs uh, to try to fit the presence of a core. So we try to fit this type of profile. We try to fit the fact that there's a core and using, for example, ultrafaint dwarfs, and in this case, SEGI-1, we are able to put this bound on the mass, but we did it for um, other 
dwarfs also. And this is the strongest constraint to date in the mass of fuzzy dark matter. And it shows the fuzzy dark matter around 10 to the minus 19 EV. There's also this bound here that you might have noticed that goes kind of against all the other bounds, which are the ones that come from dwarf spheroidals, the large, the biggest ones, the luminous ones. Uh, the previous bounds were the ultra faint dwarfs. These ones are the luminous, the biggest uh, dwarfs. And if you use Fornax and Sculptor, you have the bound that the mass of the fuzzy dark matter should be very small. So this is the forbidden region. And doing exactly the same analysis that we did for the ultra faint dwarf. So this is actually an open question. Um, why this luminous dwarf uh, gives us um, this bound that doesn't fit any of the other bounds. Um, we think that it might be because um, there is a huge influence of baryons. So baryonic processes are very important in those systems and we should take them into account. Maybe we shouldn't use a universal profile for the core and the, the halo. Uh, but this is definitely a challenge for the fuzzy dark matter model. We have to understand this a little bit better. I won't have time to show, but um, we have an ongoing work saying that we really should not use a universal profile for the core of our, for the core halo relation um, in the galaxies because they really might vary a lot and change the mass of the fuzzy dark matter by a factor of sometimes even eight. Um, so I won't have time to discuss this. Just so, so we can summarize, um, 10 to the minus 22 would be the sweet spot, the one that would solve, for example, the small scale problems. This seems to be um, excluded now by many different data, uh, especially the Lyman alpha, which is one of the, maybe the best bound that we have. All of these bounds here might be plagued by baryonic effects and other uncertainty systematic effects that might um, alter them. Uh, so we should take them with a grain of salt. But we have this mystery here why the dwarfs um, really gives us a completely complementary bound. But we're reaching, we're getting to a place that we can constrain the mass of the um, fuzzy dark matter. Uh, so the other models are still highly unconstrained. So we need more future, um, uh, future observations. We also need new simulations. And this is something that I'm doing with my group. We're simulating the fuzzy dark matter model, the self-interacting fuzzy dark matter model. We're also searching for vortices. Um, and some other groups are trying to find new ways of probing the power spectrum on small scales to try to see um, the different behavior that this model has and even these interference patterns. Like I said, I won't talk about the superfluid dark matter in this talk, but I'll be very happy to answer questions. And um, because of time, I think I'll finish. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. That was great. Um, right, so remember all the okay, Sears, Emily's email from this morning. Please, you know, don't be all the young people, especially, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, the more questions, the better. So if there's any particular young people, please, I'll, I'll pick you first. So please raise your hand um, and don't be scared. If not, I'm going to have to be forced to ask uh, a very naive question. <laughs> okay, we'll start with that. So, um, so I, uh, your light dark matter, I guess, is technically cold. That's it, it has to be cold, unlike yes. say neutrinos, which would be hot. Yeah, it has to be produced non thermally, so it's cold today. Yeah. So then I guess that is this, the, these initial models and that's what sets the bound of this one times 10 to the minus 28. Is that true? If, if it's smaller than that, then it's, all, then it's also hot? Or... Um, no, I think, uh, so is the formation mechanism that they have um, that is going to um, 
force the, uh, say that they are cold today. This 10 to the minus 28 that I said, uh, it is um, so it behaves like dark matter today. Otherwise, it will behave like dark energy today, for example. And we have some models that have that. For example, if I have a lower mass, um, but um, it is the formation mechanism. So it's the fact that this was never in contact with the thermal bath, in, in thermal equilibrium with the thermal bath in our universe that tells you that it is cold. And we have many different type of um, formation mechanism um, for this. David Marsh is the specialist on that, for example. Um, but yeah, this 10 to the minus 28 that I said is only so the solution uh, of this uh, equation, the behavior of this is the one of dark matter today. Okay, uh, Alexandra? Yes. Thank you very much for the talk. It was a very interesting review. Um, absolutely not an expert on the topic. So I wanted to ask you um, about the bounds on the mass. You said that you have this graph that shows all the bounds that yes. you presently have on, yes, exactly this one. Um, so if I understood correctly, all the things that you show are for Bidding the mass, all the, the highlighted boxes? Yeah, so the highlighted boxes are the forbidden places. Um, so let's say um, this bound here, um, maybe David can comment a little bit. I think it's being challenged a little bit. Uh, so let's just for now uh, exclude this one. So if you see those bounds, and of course, take it with a grain of salt, some of them, because they might have systematic effects here. So you could see that you could only have a very tiny place here where all where it's still allowed for this model, right? Something between here, I don't know, 10 to the minus 20 to 10 to the minus uh, 19, something really small, uh, which is still allowed. That, of course, if you don't consider this one from dwarf spheroidals, which is here in the middle saying that um, this should be really small. This should be smaller than 10 to the minus 22. So yeah, so this is um, where we are now. So all of the other bounds kind of allow still this region here. Of course, higher mass is allowed. I'm not saying that you can have axions that are 10 to the minus five EV that behave like dark matter. Yes, they can. but. I'm talking about these ultralight ones that really have this behavior in galaxies. So for this ones, uh, the region that is allowed is really a small region here with this caveat here uh, of this, um, this bound here that is in the middle. So yeah, we are only allowing larger masses, I would say from 10 to the minus 20 to 10 to the minus 19. And these larger masses are the ones that have less phenomenology, right? So they're closer and closer to the CDM. So this is also very interesting. Okay, I see. So how, how do you reconcile uh, the fact that many observables actually um, don't give this mass uh, that you sort of expect to have this large phenomenology? That's what I'm not sure I understood very well. Um, so uh, we can only put bounds on those, uh, right? So for now, our bounds are telling us that they might be there, but they might not be as strong as we expected. For example, if it's 10 to the minus 22, we would have a very large core in the side of the galaxy. For example, this is what these dwarfs expect. So we see a large core. Uh, it, it can have a different origin, for example. So it's not that we don't see the effects. We can only put bounds on defects, for example, the Lyman alpha can only tell you that we have, uh, we allow for such a suppression. Um, we only have power to constrain this suppression at certain points. So it's not that we don't see, we just see that they are not so strong as if the mass was smaller, for example. Um, if we were to detect something like the interference patterns or vortices, this would be a more direct way of really probing this wave nature, because some of those um, some of those effects are also degenerate with other effects. For example, baryonic effects, uh, baryons. Uh, if I put baryons, they also suppress structure on small scales. 
if I have warm dark matter, it's also suppressed. So we have not only to see if the suppression is different and what are the signatures, but um, but they are also degenerate. So we uh, those bounds uh, they are really probing those things and. Um, yeah, so it's not that we don't see, we can only put bounds on how those effects can influence, yeah. Thank Please you. let me know if I did answer here. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Ariel, go ahead. Yeah, I'm responding to this call for youngsters to ask questions. Um, <laughs> so, so you mentioned in passing that strong lensing, you mentioned that measurements of substructures from strong lensing could be of interest. I wonder if you could care to uh, expand on that, where you see the biggest opportunities. Yeah, I, I really do believe that strong lensing, it is a very important um, uh, probe for this, uh, not only to look for substructures. So we want to see subhalos or the lack of subhalos. So if we detect a bunch of subhalos of 10 to the minus 10 to the seven solar masses. So this is, uh, this already puts a big bound in those models. Uh, on top of that, uh, lately this year, people have been developing ways of uh, probing the small scale power spectrum using um, strong lensing. So using uh, the convergency. So this, oh, I, don't, I don't think I put the, so I didn't put the papers here. Uh, but not only here, we're talking about like really seeing the subhalos, but we're really talking about building a way of constructing the small scale power spectrum from this convergence power spectrum. And really trying to see if I see the suppression that I expect on small scales. And more than that, there is a paper um, two months ago that tries to use the small scale power spectrum from strong lensing to try to see the interference patterns. So really trying to see kiloparsec um, uh, changes in the power spectrum using strong lensing. So I would say strong lensing, not only to really map the substructure inside the halo, but also these new ideas of using it to construct the small scale power spectrum are very uh, promising. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, Fouad, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks, Elisa. It was a very nice and accessible talk, very interesting. Uh, so I am an outsider to the field, uh, so my question may not make much sense, but I will ask it anyway. Okay, so the question is that, uh, so assuming that all of these considerations are actually completely classical, so we don't go into the details of quantum behavior, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, how much can we trust wave behavior on such large scales? So if you solve equations, of course, you will get wave behavior. It doesn't matter how large your wavelength is. But in reality, can we actually expect real wave behavior to survive over galactic scales? Because then we really require that you have this huge wave with large wavelengths, and you actually are able to maintain coherence over such large distances. Like for electromagnetic waves, if we go to the extreme limit of zero mass, for electromagnetic situations, we don't really see wave behavior, isn't it? We see like classical backgrounds, like magnetic backgrounds, magnetic field backgrounds, but we don't, as far as I think, we don't see really wave behavior. So the question is, how realistic is it to really expect wave behavior on such large scales? Um I think that's a very interesting question, really very interesting. Um, so yeah, of course, in galaxies, we are in this classical regime, right? Um, because we have high equation number. Um, so we are describing this as this classical wave, right? That follows this uh, Schrodinger equation. Um, but if you go ahead and you say that, um, for example, I have uh, coherence of this field inside of galaxy, uh, there's a very, um, yeah, so for example, when this galaxy forms, which is a very uh, messy process and really out of equilibrium process, can I still maintain this coherence, right? And for example, I'm, my opinion, my personal opinion is that you cannot 
That's why I think that this coherence should come later after this, this halo thermalizes, uh, and then you can find coherence. Again, uh, it is very hard to show this coherence because let's be honest that the halo is not a very simple place to, um, to calculate stuff, right? Uh, so there's many things entering there. Uh, but there are two views, I would say. So one view that this coherence uh, is established at early times. So you have this field in um, the k equals zero. So it's in the ground state. And this coherence is maintained until late times. And what you have is this coherence from, late, from early times at late times. And there's this other view that I would say I like more, but of course I cannot prove yet and we're still studying that coherence, it is broken in the formation of the halo and then coherence is obtained again after the halo thermalizes. So you read, yeah, you have coherence again. But again, it's very hard to show coherence. You're completely right. And that's why I would say that we still haven't proven that you really have this coherence. What we have shown is that we have a description of this classical fields and the k equals zero in the ground state. And that's all we have, uh, I think, shown uh, and by now, yeah. So what does this mean? And if this really stays for a more realistic halo, I think that's a very interesting question. And thank you for asking. I would love to hear other people's opinion about this because this is really an open topic. This is really, and there's still some people that believe that even classicality could be broken in some parts of the, of the halo, because it's not every part of the halo that you have high occupation number, for example. You can have part of the halo that you don't. So you can have like instances of maybe breaking of the classical behavior. And, and this is an active field of study at this moment. Thank you very much. You're welcome, my pleasure. We go ahead, Veronia. Michael, get, go first. Okay, Michael, go ahead. Yep. Um, um, thanks for the um, nice overview. Um, I, I um, was wondering if you have seen this um, paper that I've posted in the chat oh, by Pozo et al. that use Milky Way um, um, satellites um, and their kind of fit function to the um, density profile of these um, spherically averaged. Um, simu um, halos they find in their simulation and they claim to actually find um, evidence for this very small mass of 10 to the minus 22 EV. So yes. rather than having just bounds on the mass, they even claim a detection, which is of course in contradiction to all the other measurements that you've um, shown yeah. on the slide. Yeah, so let me... So I was wondering if you have an opinion on that. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, so I would say this is, yeah, there's this article. Um, it is um, kind of old, right? We, we had other people that we did this analysis. Um, and indeed, uh, depending on which dwarfs you use, uh, actually, so they, they claim that it's this mass, but it's like an estimate. So they don't even give you error bars. Right, so it's really an estimate of, of, of the mass. Um, some people complain about some of the methods of this paper, but I don't want to enter into this. So you can see, for example, here, we also have claimed measurements really in Draco and sextants um, that really say like, oh, we measured using um, this, um, the fact that there's a core, we measure the mass and the mass is small. Uh, uh, but some people really, um, there's still some discussion about the methods that you use to measure uh, those profiles um, to, to get those measurements here. So what did you assume for the profile? Uh, how did you, uh, uh, yeah, so how did you, did you do the entire analysis? I didn't have time to show here, but um, for example, this analysis that you get the stellar kinematic data from these dwarfs, um, and you get to the mass, right, using this MCMC. So you have to assume some things. You have to assume the profile, the stellar density profile, the dark matter profile. There's always the question, am I really probing the dark matter profile, right? So what is the influence of variance there? So 
Uh, I think we should take all of those bounds from dwarfs uh, with a grain of salt. They can really have the influence of those systematic effects, um, especially those luminous dwarfs here. Um, I think this is very expected. And I think in this paper that you showed, I'm not sure, but I think they use those, those luminous dwarfs, not ultra faint dwarfs like we used in this work. So yeah, there's many places here where we can have uncertainty of this mass. My opinion is that in general, in the literature, and even in my work here, I think we underestimate error bars. Um, we should take into consideration um, the uncertainties that we have in some of the modeling um, of, for example, how we model the core. This is, we have been showing simulations that there's a huge uncertainty here. So there is a huge variety of different core to halo masses. So depending on the from how you formed your halo, the history of this halo, uh, is it coming from a merge or not? Uh, is it tidally disrupted or not? You have a very different relation between the mass of the halo and the mass of the core. And this enters those um, estimates. Um, so I really believe that those error bars, when they show error bars, which is already good when they show error bars, um, they are underestimated. Um, and we should really take those bounds with a grain of salt. We should really think about them a little bit better. I don't know if I answered your question. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Can go ahead now, Haranya. Yeah, just as a comment about that paper, I just wanted to say that um, 10 to the minus 22 is something like less than 99.7 or something credible interval in our live and alpha analysis. So it's completely contradicted by that bound. Um, my question, uh, th thanks very much for a really, really clear and nice talk. My question was about your comment about the universality of, of the halo profile. Can you expand on, on that? Yes, thank you so much for asking. I'm sorry that I couldn't go through your paper. And I completely agree with you. I think if we were around here, we could say that um, it's still don't know, but like 10 to the minus 22 is really challenged nowadays. That paper that you showed is a bit uh, old. And I think 10 to the minus 22 is really challenged by many different observables at the moment. So let me just go back about the universality. So um, when we're going to fit the core, uh, uh, to this uh, kinematic data that we, uh, that we have from stars, we have to assume um, how the, the density of this core comes. And we have this from simulations. We always use the sheaf from 2014. And here we have the core density, depends on the mass and depends on the radius of the core. And this radius of the core depends on the mass of the core. So I have this relation between the mass of the core and the mass of the halo. Uh, that I show here from Shiv 2014, for example. And Shiv in 2014, in his simulations, he found that the relation between the core and the halo goes like this, to the one third. Then Mox in 2019, but also Nori and Nima, they showed that actually this is much steeper. Um, the mass of the core goes as uh, five ninths to the mass of the halo. And this is uh, very important. This can really change the estimates of the mass here. Um, so in this work that should be out this month for sure uh, with my student Joette and also with Simon May. Uh, May has the biggest simulations of FDM that we have nowadays, which are like 10 uh, megaparsec. We studied that um, and we were able to find this type of relation. So when we have the core mass over the halo mass, we see that there is actually a huge spread. So that the, the black dots here are the sheaf ones, the sheaf simulations. And this black uh, dash line is his profile. Uh, Mott's profile is somewhere around here on the top here. I don't show here. So we showed that actually, when you get these larger simulations, um, you can have all these types of halos and cores. So it's actually um, much more diverse than we expected, um, than what these two works have shown. Um, and this diversity encompasses those two, um, those two um, 
uh, those two relations actually. Um, it's very hard for us from the simulation to really pinpoint what it is. So we know here we have halos that are mergers. So they have very different merger histories. Um, we have um, possible effects of tidal disruption. We have here in green, for example, um, those are simulations of only the halo. So those are not cosmological simulations, we're simulating one halo. And we have here um, solital mergers, for example. And we show that they are more like the MOX, uh, 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 what is expected by MOX. Um, so yeah, we showed in this work that there is a huge variability for how the core and the halo um, relate. And this can actually impact the mass, um, not by a lot, but actually by something like eight times, uh, something like two times the, the value. So we can make an error of like 80% um, on the mass or something like that. Yeah, sorry, sorry to ask a naive question, but, but what, what mass halos are we talking about here? So yeah, so in these simulations, we cannot get to a very large, we cannot get to Milky Way like masses, like she was able. Uh, we can only simulate the smaller halos of something around 10 to, 10 to the 10 to 10 to the eight um, solar masses. So this is one um, thing that um, it's we could not do in our simulations uh, yet. So for from the simulations of May, we only have just a few of those big halos. So this is something that is different, for example, from Shiv simulation. He has a higher mass. He has the lower mass ones, but he also has higher mass halos. So there was a recent work uh, uh, in the you know CDM context that was uh, quantifying the universality of the CDM halo profile, holding to some incredible range of uh, you know masses. Uh, this was in Nature, I think, or possibly the Virgo Consortium. So is this result telling us something deep about how CDM halos relax? Compared compared to this model, to the FDM, yeah, um, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, because for example, here we can see that we have the, a, a huge diversity in the sense that um, if I have two halos that each of them has one core, what is the final halo with with the, what is the core of this final halo, right? Um, but also here we have things that are still in the merging process. So we did not separate into things that we know that are already, um, they have finalized the merger. So I don't know, that's a very good question actually. And I don't know this paper that you're talking about, if you could point yeah, to I'm me. Yeah, I'm gonna try to find that. it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, for us, it's very hard for us from the simulation to really pinpoint what is causing this. But we think it's this different merger histories um, uh, from from these halos that we have. Um, but the merger histories are pretty much more or less a lambda CDM type, right? Yeah, but do we, oh, that's a good point, but do we know how the, how the cores behave in the end, uh, depending on the different merger histories? Um, also, we, we found that maybe there's some tidal stripping uh, that from the simulations that we uh, that might be happening to cause a little bit of this spreading. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. I'm trying to find the paper, but if oh, I don't manage you. to do it live, I, I will send it to you. Thank you so much. Yes, that would be very useful because yeah, we saw this in simulation and um, we can, since we have like big simulations, bigger than the other simulations that were done, we were able to get more halos. So when we tried to get a profile, we just saw that it encompasses those two profiles. So we were trying to understand what is going on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. There's no other questions um, and I think we had a lot so that's great sorry for the baby <laughs> um, uh, thanks again
great talk. Um, and, uh, uh, and thanks everyone for coming and sticking around. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for all the questions and comments. Thank you. I pasted the, the paper. In oh, the, thank you the so chat. much. Thanks. <laughs> thanks again. Take thank care. Thank you.